A U.S. official tells CBS News that North Korea fired off two projectiles into the Sea of Japan, which are most likely short-range ballistic missiles. If verified, the move would mark a United Nations violation. Last weekend, Pyongyang also launched two cruise missiles in what is believed to be the first known weapons test from North Korea since President Biden took office. So Christina Rafina is tracking the latest on this and other news overseas, and she is joining us now from Washington. So Christina, I, I don't know if this comes comes as uh, an incredible surprise, uh, North Korea, uh, North Korea's goals with these tests, uh, are they any different than what we've seen in the past? They typically do something like this whenever South Korea and the U.S. are participating in their joint military training sessions. I suppose it wouldn't be an incredible surprise, too, that we have a new administration. So this may be the time that North Korea tries to sort of flex some muscle. So I guess the question is sort of how seriously should these um, moves be taken? Well, look, I think North Korean action should always be taken seriously because it, it shares a border with a close ally of the U.S. and because they're clearly doing it for a reason. It is odd, however, that, like you said, they didn't do these strikes. Uh, sorry, they didn't launch these missiles during the joint exercises. They launched a lot of rhetoric instead. Uh, Kim Jong-il's sister, uh, yet last week while Blinken was in, uh, Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken was in, Nor was, I'm sorry, was in South Korea speaking with mm -hmm. allies, they launched this series of rhetoric saying the U.S. better not cause a stink and warning them to back off and saying, you know, they needed to engage and they needed to drop sanctions. Obviously, that's a non-starter for the U.S. Blinken is now back in the U.S. and all of a sudden, you know, here we go with the missile launches. Now, these are shorter range. Uh, they're not as they're not ICBMs. They're not as threatening. They don't usually carry nuclear warheads. But North Korea obviously did this for a reason. They want to get the administration's attention. So far, the Biden administration has reached out and said it hasn't heard back from North Korea. Uh, so we're not quite sure where this relationship goes from here. When we were overseas, I was on that trip with the secretary, and I asked him in Korea, maybe we should switch to a policy of containment. If, if North Korea is not going to engage, is it better to just try to to try to manage the threat rather than getting them to talk because the last administration engaged them to uh, to an incredible degree, you know, holding hands and walking across the border. And yet here we are with the same problems day after day. Well, you recall, Christina, that according to the former president, uh, it was a love affair. So there's that, uh, you know, that <laughs> there we should... have been no beautiful letters in this administration. <laughs> exactly. Vlad. There are no so giant I, envelopes I, coming I, to the White House. I suspect that the relationship between uh, President Biden and the North Korean dictator will be a little bit different. But the, your point, though, and I was glad you brought up your travel with the secretary of state uh, because he did travel to South Korea as well as Japan. And I was curious as to what sort of engagement he had with South Korean officials um, with regards to North Korea, because obviously, as we've always reported, those that are most get most at risk from North Korean aggression remain their neighbors, South Korea and, of course, Japan, which the Secretary of State also visited. Well, that was the other question I asked at the press conference was, you know, have your South Korean counterparts asked you to say anything or, or bring any kind of message uh, to the rest of the world on, on North Korea? What are you guys talking about with North Korea? Have the South Koreans asked the U.S. to take any kind of action, specific action, when it comes to North Korea? And the secretary said, you know, I'm more concerned with the messaging coming out of our allies and partners. I, you know, I want to talk about our alliances. I want to talk about what we're doing to rebuild a strong Indo-Pacific strategy which is something they're really trying to place emphasis on, which is why his first overseas trip during COVID was to Japan and Korea. But you can't help but think that that trip had, had two goals, right? Because at the tail end of it, he met with the Chinese in Alaska, and U.S. officials said it was really important to have that meeting after they had met with the U.S. allies in the region to show kind of this solidarity, this unified uh, show of force. But also, you know, the U.S., uh, the new administration has got to figure out what it wants to do about North Korea. A former administration official who worked on this policy told me at the end of the day they thought they left the car with North Korea kind of in the middle of the road, not off to this side and not off to this side. And they were hoping maybe the next administration could push it a little farther down the road. But, you know, the car breaks down a lot and it's kind of a weird engine and no one is really quite sure how it runs. So they have to take it basically a day at a time. I got to ask you about another story that's been making news over the past few days. There is a large cargo ship that is stuck in Egypt's Suez Canal. It's almost sort of, it basically is blocking the whole thing. I think it's the largest cargo ship in the world. So as a result, no traffic can get in and out. So I got a bunch of questions for you, but I think people need to know just how significant the Suez Canal is, um, just how much gl global 
traffic goes through there. Do we have any idea what caused this? I know what they were initially saying. I don't know if they have any more information because their initial hypothesis was to me, suspect, little flawed there. Um, and also, you know, what are they doing to get this thing unstuck? Okay, well, I'm going to take a moment here and say I'm not a maritime expert, but I can talk to you about the political <laughs> implications of the Suez Canal. What I've heard so far this morning from, um, you know, reading up on sources and, uh, you know, some very, very interesting deep dives on maritime blogs that are much smarter than I am, is uh, there was a sandstorm. They think possibly, you know, there was a current that basically rotated the ship sideways. And because these ships are so big, you know, they've expanded the canal over the years. It's supposed to be able to handle these giant, giant tankers. This ship is a quarter of a mile long. I mean, that is a huge, huge tanker. The problem is when it rotated sideways, it basically got wedged up on the banks and now it's stuck. So all that traffic trying to get through, it's literally sideways across the canal and, and everything is stopped. About 8 to 12 percent of the world's uh, maritime traffic goes through that canal. And it's so important because if they can't cut through there, they have to circumnavigate, go all the way around Africa. And it's a much, much longer voyage, which is why they built the canal in the first place. Like this has been, this canal goes back to Napoleon, okay? Napoleon tried to get a route through that area so that he could better access trade routes and things in Asia. They tried it. They made some bad measurements. It didn't work. So then they tried it again. The French tried it again with the Egyptians. They started digging the canal. Uh, the French were occupying Egypt as colonial powers. They had control of the canal. Then the Brits got involved because the Egyptians went bankrupt. So the Brits bought out. So it's a, it's a mess. It has been owned by the French, by the British, by the French and the British, by the French, the British and the Egyptians. And then when President Nasser came to power, it was this big symbol of Egyptian independence from colonial powers. He nationalized the canal, as anyone who has watched The Crown will remember. And, <laughs> and now, now Egypt controls it. And it's a big, big source of revenue. It's also a big source of national pride because it's so important to global trade. Egypt can say, look, we, we have this. We control this. And that makes us a power player. They can shut it down at will. They shut it down during conflicts with the Israelis in the 70s. It's an important strategic choke point for the world. And, and Egypt knows that and has played that to its advantage. However, this advantage is no one because they didn't do it on purpose. Uh, there's no strategy behind this. There's just a really large stuck ship and it's screwing up global trade. That, that uh, 1956 uh, Suez crisis, the military action between France, Britain, and uh, Egypt was was is a fascinating historical antecedent, uh, Christina, because as you know, um, this was a moment in time for the Egyptians that led to uh, General Nasser being seen as a big nationalist hero for Egyptians, um, and essentially humiliated Britain and France, which were at the time superpowers, they still are, but uh, had never been sort of put in that position before. What is interesting interesting, too, is your point about now trade having to go around the southern tip of Africa. I don't know if we have that satellite image that shows the ship wedged in the midst of, in the middle of the canal there. But essentially, they don't think that they're going to be able to, um, the, the ship's not going to be able to be removed for at least 48 hours, which means all of the things that travel through, all the uh, material, whether it's oil, machinery parts that generally go through the Suez Canal, will have to now go around the southern tip of Africa, which I know Trevor Noah joked about it, but it's a big deal because it, it's the whole reason why the Suez Canal was, was dug in the first place. And, and lots of you know, at the time, very powerful colonial powers wanted this dug for that reason, because it takes so much time off that route. And it's less treacherous because you don't have to go through all those waters. You know, a, a lot can happen in those waters between weather, piracy, all of the above. This was really, really strategic for the French. Then the Brits realized, oh, no, we got to get in on this because they're going to beat us. And, and the, the British wanted to get to their colony in India. And then that was one of the reasons that, that Nasser took it back over, because he knew that this was really, really crucial. Uh, look, they're trying to get this ship. They've got to try to float it up a little bit, my understanding is, and kind of shove it back sideways. This is my very precise maritime uh, information I'm giving you guys. Um, <laughs> if you saw, they're trying everything. They've got tugboats. They've got, in proportion to this ship, what looks like a teeny tiny digger trying to dig it out of the stand. They might drain some of the ballast. They might drain some of the fuel. They're working on it. But now those ship captains who are trying to get through have to make the decision whether they want to wait it out and see if they can move this ship in two or three days or whether they want to cut their loss 
losses and go ahead and embark on that longer route all the way around. And look, global trade is already messed up because of COVID, right? Supply lines are, are uncertain. Uh, production was delayed in a lot of places, and it's just now getting slightly back on track, but it's fragile. So we really could feel the repercussions of this shake throughout the economy, depending on how long this remains shut down. I do think it's fascinating, guys, when that you... we're talking so much about this, because um, when the Suez uh, Canal was first constructed um, in the 19th century, it was seen, it is still seen, as one of the great wonders of the world, right? Man actually slicing through a, um, the, the amount of earth and land to create this, this canal. And we've put men uh, and we've put women into space, and Mother Nature is like, hold my beer, let me show you what I can still do. I don't care how big your ship is, I don't mm -hmm. care how many big brains worked on this particular feat of engineering marvelous, uh, you know, it, it is pretty remarkable. And canals are, when you are interesting in there. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Amory. I'll stop nerding out about canals. No, no, yeah, we're all nerding out. <laughs> no, you guys, you, you, I was going to crack a joke. You <laughs> are about to educate people, so you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, was going to say, canals <laughs> are controversial because the history of canals does involve colonialism, right? The Panama Canal, the Suez Canal, these were routes built by foreign powers through territory that wasn't really theirs to access other territory that also wasn't really theirs. Uh, so they've been controversial but they've also been really important and that's why I think people are, are really fascinated by this and why why the canals uh, kind of have this this memorable point in our history books because it's not just about the water it's not just about the shipping it's about the communities that were forced to build it the the governments that were taken advantage of the land that was seized and and all the things that go with it so I'll, I'll stop nerding out now please go ahead love it no love I completely it. agree and I think and I think you know the, the size of the ship is fascinating to a lot of people it's like I think four and a half football fields long it, it see I what I was going to say is if you've ever seen me trying to parallel park in downtown Philadelphia <laughs> then it's probably what it looks like as they try to move this ship inch by inch back and forth <laughs> that's really um, funny <laughs> so but we do have other things to talk to you about um listen before we let you go we do have to sort of get back into uh one of the reasons that we brought you here um because uh, the secretary of state anthony blinken has been very very busy he's uh, been meeting um he's had had a nato meeting um and among the topics discussed of course was russia and China and the nature of the relationship that the U.S. will have uh, with those two countries moving forward with this new administration. Can you give us any insight? Yeah, well, Russia, I mean, uh, Russia has always been a bit of an antagonist, but there's a renewed focus in this administration on China. And again, that was another reason for this, this trip that, that Secretary Blinken made to Asia before he met with the Chinese in Alaska. We were there for that meeting, and I don't know if you guys remember what happened, but it, you know, for, for people who cover diplomacy, that was like huge rhetorical fireworks because the Chinese and the Americans got in a room and the, uh, the Americans made their opening statement, which was pointed at China and talked about, you know, uh, Taiwan and Xinjiang and, and Hong Kong and these things that it really disagrees with China about. The Chinese then went on for 15 minutes uh, lecturing America about Black Lives Matter and human rights and how our world order is in everyone else's world order. Now, keep in mind, this was consecutive translation. So everybody in the room had to wait for 15 minutes to, to let the leader finish. And then we had to sit through another 15 minutes of the translation after which the press, we got ready to leave, and the press handlers were like, okay, thank you, thank you, press, thank you, press. And Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan said, no, 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 stay, we have more to say. We stayed, they gave another rebuttal to the Chinese. Then the press handler said, okay, really, you can leave now. Then the Chinese yelled and said, no, we want to speak again. It went back and forth and back and forth, and it was this very, very tense meeting because both sides are trying to play out their version of what they think the world should look like. And the Chinese, as, uh, as Defense Secretary Austin has said, are the United States pacing power, right? We need to keep up with them. We need to set pace with them. And the administration is trying to set that pace. So in addition to speaking to the Chinese, speaking to our allies in the Indo-Pacific, Secretary Blinken also wanted to speak to the Europeans about, among other things, how we as United Allies and NATO are going to counter them as a military force as well. You know, NATO was designed to keep the Germans down, America in, and the Russians out, is the old saying. But NATO, it's new NATO, it's a new century, and there are new threats, and one of those threats is China. Uh, Christina Rafina, uh, Rafini, it's so great to, why did I say Rafina? I have no idea. It's close enough. Uh, yeah, it's no, close no, enough. I think I was going to say you're so refined, because w you need to be, like, regular on our... <laughs> 
broadcast because uh, maybe we need to develop like a, a CBSN What to Watch with you doing it because I know you're busy in your new role as a CBS News correspondent and you cover the State Department and you got a lot of things going on. But, you know, we would just have a lot of fun breaking down what's happening all around yeah. the world, but adding your nerdness to it would be, I think, <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> Vlad, I'm here for you guys anytime I'm in like the country. I, was, <laughs> I feel like I was in the room. Honestly, that was really descriptive. <laughs> we love you, Rafini. Thank you it's so, so much. It's so nice to see you. Thank you, guys. Have a good morning. You too.